Section twelve of Jane Austen's Juvenilia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Austen's Juvenilia. A letter from a young lady whose feelings being too strong for her judgment led her into the commission of errors which her heart disapproved. Many have been the cares and vicissitudes of my past life, my beloved Elinor, and the only consolation I feel for their bitterness is that, on a close examination of my conduct, I am convinced that I have strictly deserved them. I murdered my father at a very early period of my life. I have since murdered my mother, and I am now going to murder my sister. I have changed my religion so often that at present I have not an idea of any left. I have been a perjured witness in every public trial for these last twelve years, and I have forged my own will. In short, there is scarcely a crime that I have not committed. But I am now going to reform. Colonel Martin of the Horse Guards has paid his addresses to me, and we are to be married in a few days. As there is something singular in our courtship, I will give you an account of it. Colonel Martin is the second son of the late Sir John Martin, who died immensely rich, but, bequeathing only one hundred thousand pound apiece to his three younger children, left the bulk of his fortune, about eight million, to the present Sir Thomas. Upon his small pittance the Colonel lived tolerably contented for nearly four months, when he took it into his head to determine on getting the whole of his eldest brother's estate. A new will was forged, and the Colonel produced it in court, but nobody would swear to its being the right will except himself, and he had sworn so much that nobody believed him. At that moment I happened to be passing by the door of the court, and was beckoned in by the judge, who told the Colonel that I was a lady ready to witness anything for the cause of justice, and advised him to apply to me. In short, the affair was soon adjusted. The Colonel and I swore to its being the right will, and Sir Thomas has been obliged to resign all his ill-gotten wealth. The Colonel in gratitude waited on me the next day, with an offer of his hand. I am now going to murder my sister. Yours ever, Anna Parker. A Tour Through Wales, in a Letter from a Young Lady My dear Clara, I have been so long on the ramble that I have not till now had it in my power to thank you for your letter. We left our dear home on last Monday month, and have proceeded on our tour through Wales, which is a principality contiguous to England, and gives the title to the Prince of Wales. We travelled on horseback by preference. My mother rode upon our little pony, and Fanny and I walked by her side, or rather ran, for my mother is so fond of riding fast that she galloped all the way. You may be sure that we were in a fine perspiration when we came to our place of resting. Fanny has taken a great many drawings of the country, which are very beautiful, though perhaps not such exact resemblances as might be wished, from their being taken as she ran along. It would astonish you to see all the shoes we wore out in our tour. We determined to take a good stock with us, and therefore each took a pair of our own besides those we set off in. However, we were obliged to have them both capped and heel-pieced at Carmarthen, and at last, when they were quite gone, Mamma was so kind as to lend us a pair of blue satin slippers, of which we each took one, and hopped home from Hereford delightfully. I am your ever affectionate Elizabeth Johnson. A Tale A gentleman, whose family name I shall conceal, bought a small cottage in Pembrokeshire about two years ago. This daring action was suggested to him by his elder brother, who promised to furnish two rooms and a closet for him, provided he would take a small house near the borders of an extensive forest, and about three miles from the sea. Wilhelminus gladly accepted the offer, and continued for some time searching after such a retreat, when he was one morning agreeably relieved from his suspense by reading this advertisement in a newspaper. To be let. A neat cottage on the borders of an extensive forest, and about three miles from the sea. It is ready furnished except two rooms and a closet." The delighted Wilhelminus posted away immediately to his brother, and showed him the advertisement. Robertus congratulated him, and sent him in his carriage to take possession of the cottage. After travelling for three days and six nights without stopping, they arrived at the forest, and following a track which led by its side down a steep hill, over which ten rivulets meandered, they reached the cottage in half an hour. 
Wilhelminus alighted, and after knocking for some time without receiving any answer, or hearing any one stir within, he opened the door, which was fastened only by a wooden latch, and entered a small room, which he immediately perceived to be one of the two that were unfurnished. From thence he proceeded into a closet equally bare. A pair of stairs that went out of it led him into a room above, no less destitute, and these apartments he found composed the whole of the house. He was by no means displeased with this discovery, as he had the comfort of reflecting that he should not be obliged to lay out anything on furniture himself. He returned immediately to his brother, who took him the next day to every shop in town, and bought whatever was requisite to furnish the two rooms and the closet. In a few days everything was completed, and Wilhelminus returned to take possession of his cottage. Robertus accompanied him, with his lady, the amiable Cecilia, and her two lovely sisters, Arabella and Marina, to whom Wilhelminus was tenderly attached, and a large number of attendants. An ordinary genius might probably have been embarrassed, in endeavouring to accommodate so large a party, but Wilhelminus, with admirable presence of mind, gave orders for the immediate erection of two noble tents in an open spot in the forest adjoining to the house. Their construction was both simple and elegant. A couple of old blankets, each supported by four sticks, gave a striking proof of that taste for architecture, and that happy ease in overcoming difficulties, which were some of Wilhelminus's most striking virtues. End of section 12